Sermon, 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 9 and following. Have you ever felt like you've had enough? Have you ever wanted to just give up? Has life's circumstances left you depressed, or tired, scared, or lonely? Have you ever felt just lost? Have you ever asked yourself, where is God? Is he still with me? Does he know what I'm going through? Does he still love me? Is God still listening? Does he see what I'm going through? Does he even care? In the Old Testament today, we hear about Elijah and his doubt in God's presence. The text prior to our reading this morning tells us that Elijah was on the run. It was as if he was a fugitive. Jezebel wanted him dead, and she sent word to him announcing her intent that she wanted him killed. He knew her warning to be true because she has made it her mission to destroy all the Lord's prophets. So he set out and tried to escape. I pick up in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 3. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. Here is where he speaks words that every one of us can relate. He says, I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. He lay down under the bush and fell asleep. Can you relate to Elijah? Maybe your experiences have not been so severe as Elijah. Maybe you simply have been discouraged by having a bad day. As that day progresses, you find yourself asking, Where are you, God? Are you paying attention to what I'm going through? It is days like that when our faith can be tested. I have had some trying days. For those who have followed my journey of health, I imagine them saying, well, there's the understatement of the century. There was a time in our youth when it seemed as if we were unstoppable and unbreakable. It was difficult for us to really understand illness. When we saw an older person become sick or become hospitalized, it was difficult for us to relate as we become older we could understand better and empathize with people who are going through difficult times with health. I think of how much Pastor Mark Erler can now relate to anyone who has ever had shingles. If you have dealt with cancer, you can find it easier to talk with others who are going through the same illness. For myself, I have just celebrated 20 years in the pastoral ministry. So have I have had many opportunities to, uh, to minister to the sick and dying. However, after I was diagnosed as having the garbage can illness known as fibromyalgia and fatigue, I came to understand the challenge of battling with an illness day after day after day. I could also empathize better with those who owned the same illness. I learned that when a person loses their health, they go through the same stages of grief that a person facing the death of a loved one would experience. There is denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and eventually acceptance. To be honest, I did not want to write a sermon that referred to my illness. It took me years before I felt completely comfortable writing about it on Facebook. The same reason that convinced me to write on Facebook convinced me again this week to write these words to you. I thought that there might be some here today who are going through their own battles. I find it easier to listen to someone who has a similar point of reference than a person who has never suffered from pain and the psychological effects of illness. When I think upon the many souls I face who suffer illness or face some other life-changing challenge, there is one phrase I hear more than any other. I hear the words, I have had enough. I said those words in prayer last Sunday after I returned home from church. What goes on with me is that my muscles contract and form Charlie horse type pain all over my body. 
On top of that, the virus that causes what I deal with creates muscle knots, sciatic conditions, burning, stabbing, and a whole host of other symptoms, which include sleeplessness and fatigue. I cannot go to sleep often until about 5 a.m., and what sleep I do get is not restful. It is the reason why I stepped down from my call three years ago. I can handle serving here and there, but it's difficult to endure a normal pastoral schedule. Last Sunday, when I returned home, my body rebelled against me. It started while I was serving, but once I stopped moving about and focusing on my tasks and hands, which seemed to be a thing that I do that helps me focus on other things and not with pain. Well, once that stopped, the onslaught started. I spent the day in my sofa chair covered with blankets while the temperature outside was in the 90s. And believe me, I am very sensitive to the heat. I love the cold. Intense pain can often bring us chills, though, doesn't it? And as I prayed, I said to God, I have had enough of this. That is when I began looking at this Sunday's readings to think up a topic for today's sermon. It is good to dive into God's Word during difficult times. Well, once in the Word of God, I heard God whisper in the pages of 1 Kings. I saw there was Elijah running for his life, and you can see he was thinking of separating himself from his responsibilities. He left his servant behind. I began to think of a modern-day example and thought of a person leaving their home and their family and their possessions in order to be a homeless soul without food, without water, or shelter. That is a way to really give up on life. Elijah found his place of rest, and it was there where Elijah said, I have had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. When people suffer from chronic pain or a difficult trial, there is a time when that individual starts to look at eternity with God as their release. Last Sunday, the Gospel reading told us about the man who was infected with a legion of demons. And after Jesus healed him, the man wanted to go with Jesus. Jesus told the man to stay and tell others what Jesus has done for him. When I talk to people who suffer from cancer and Parkinson's, even the emptiness of losing a spouse or child, I hear them wanting to go with the Lord. But the Lord moves us to stay, doesn't he? We still have work to do. We all want that peace that is promised when we enter his kingdom, which, which one of us would want to opt out of that plan in order to remain in pain? Yet that is what we do, and we find blessings from our Lord throughout our days, even while we suffer. The Lord has taught me to count the blessings I still have rather than the ones taken away. That is what I do now, and I see how rich I am because of God. Elijah was not there yet. He was still in his despair. He knew that God did big things. When the Lord did mighty things, Elijah's strength and faith was tops. But when it seemed that God was quiet, Elijah felt as if he was on his own. That is why he ran for his life. His faith was being diminished by the threats to his life. Our faith becomes equally attacked when our health begins to diminish or some other trial backs us into a corner. We want to run as well. Well, how does God respond to our desire to run away from what we are facing? How does he respond to us when, he, when our faith feels violated or has taken a nosedive? As I read on, I saw that Elijah fell asleep. He fell asleep, feeling a bit abandoned. He fell asleep, as that is often the only place a sufferer can go to not feel their pain. Maybe Elijah felt as if he was now on his own and none of us need to feel that way about the Lord God Almighty. Yet when we are hurting, it is easy for us to forget Christ's promises that he will never leave us or forsake us. When Elijah woke, he received God's answer. <laughs> Do you know what that answer was? Did God create a big event to show forth his power and strength? No! What God did was tend to a need that we often take for granted. Which one of us, when we cry out before God, see God's answer to our 
prayer by saying, get up and eat something. Have some granola, eat some eggs, drink some water. Yet that is what God did for Elijah. Upon seeing God's response to all this huge despair from Elijah, I laughed. Wow. Just waking up and being able to eat something is a gift from God. Just getting up and walking and fixing something to eat, that is readily available to us, is also a blessing from God. When we see all the simple things that we take for granted as, as gifts from the Almighty, life becomes a whole lot sweeter. Look at what we receive today. It's so simple. The bread and the wine, but our Lord attaches his body and blood given for the forgiveness of our sins. Can you imagine how Elijah felt when he woke up and was told to eat? Like this? This is your answer, God? Yup, Elijah looked around and there by his head was some bread that was baked over hot coals and in a jar of water. He ate and he drank and he lay down again. The Lord provided. I think here Elijah did not get the gist of what God was doing because Elijah ate and then went back to sleep again. He still went back to bed to escape. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. Oh, now there's a journey attached to the meal. Well, God was preparing him for something. So he got up and he ate and he drank and strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Oreb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. The 40 days and 40 nights remind us of something being completed. What it tells me is that God takes his time. The answers do not always flow quickly, or quick as we want them to flow anyway. We know that the Lord, however, took care of Elijah throughout these 40 days and 40 nights. Now Elijah is ready to listen. Now God speaks. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah speaks, and it seems very much like something we would pray. It sounded like something I prayed. What I prayed when I realized I had to step down from that which I loved, being a pastor to a congregation, you know, that which I worked so hard to achieve, was something like, Lord, you made me your servant and I have been faithful to your word, yet you have sent me to congregations that rebelled against your word or were too difficult for me, and now that I am in a wonderful congregation, my health is attacking me. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? Here is what Elijah prayed. He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Do you think there was a similarity between Elijah's prayer and my own? His was a fear of death. Mine was a fear of illness. Both of us were afraid. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. I bet Elijah was waiting for something big to happen now. You know, I can imagine many of you going through life dealing with frustration and then coming to church hoping for a huge sermon that will resound with all the answers you need. Maybe you will go to a Bible study feeling broken and instead of receiving needed comforts, you were just reminded that others were struggling as well. Maybe you ended up being the comforter. I have met many a Christian tell me that they expected so much when they went to church, but felt the same after they left. We often look for answers in the biggest of ways. We look for signs and wonders, possibly. God has to appear to me in something big and something grand. We do not necessarily think such a thing, but we often look for it. And I think God knew that about Elijah. There he was, a servant of the Most High God, and God, and, um, uh, instead of seeing uh, God's amazing work changing lives, he saw that God's word caused them to chase Elijah in fear. It is easy for us to look for God in the big things. 
Elijah recently had just been victorious in the showdown with the 450 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Even God had sent fire down from heaven to consume Elijah's sacrifice. In addition, the prophet had predicted a terrible famine, and the Lord had not sent rain for three years. And after that time, Elijah prayed, and, and God produced a torrential downpour. God was working mightily through his servant Elijah. This made him very unpopular with Ahab and Jezebel, as you know, the wicked king and queen of Israel. We read in 1 Kings 19, 1-3 again, that now Ahab had told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of the one of them by tomorrow about this time. You and I see all the big events which God has revealed himself to his people. And so we often look for such a big event in our days, during our trials. Jesus healed all sorts of people. Why can't he heal me as well? It would be nice if God did the big things in our life, but faith is not about seeing, is it? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. In fact, isn't the gift of faith a big event from God? Is not reading the word of God a big event? God is, after all, speaking to us. To me, that is amazing. God placed this story in the Bible for a purpose. I believe one such purpose was as a lesson to teach us what God wants from us during such difficult times. First, the Lord shows us what we expected. We wanted to see the big stuff, right? So the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Here it is, the great big stuff is about to happen. So then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And the wind there was an earthquake, uh, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. How are we supposed to figure out what God is doing in those events anyway? Surely we do not say, uh-oh, another earthquake in Edmund. God is trying to tell us something. We do not need to look there. After the earthquake came, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire either. So how did God communicate to Elijah? 1 Kings 19.12 And after the fire came a gentle whisper. I once had a teacher who tried all sorts of ways to get the attention of our fourth grade class. Sometimes, rather than shouting, the teacher would whisper, Class, turn to page 45. Class, turn to page 45. Like E.F. Hutton. When E.F. Hutton speaks, what did the commercial convey? People listen. Do you remember everyone stopped what they were doing to listen? This is what God wants of us. To listen. The Lord speaks to us in a gentle whisper which conveys comfort and peace and understanding and his presence. Now God still does the big things, but even when he does them, they seem small and insignificant to the world. Think upon Jesus. Many expected him to be an earthly king, that he would rule mightily. What does Jesus do? He picks up the cross and dies upon it. Many did not see the bang. They only noticed the whimper. But Christ whispered there as well when he said, It is finished. It is finished. If you can give me a few minutes more, I would like to show you the power of silence. May we at this moment listen to silence. I could hear my clock ticking, or we can hear cars, or a plane, or someone clearing their throat, or maybe a sneeze. I was hoping I would not hear a yawn. So imagine what God can do when you look for a whisper. Imagine what you will hear when you take his word to a quiet place. It is where you will find peace. It is where you will feel even closer to God. It is where you will find answers. God does not need to do the big things because he has already done them. Yet even his whisper speaks volumes. 
May anyone here today who has been battling illness or depression or trial or other challenges of life be encouraged to turn off everything and go to a private place to read God's word and to listen. Know that you will be reminded that your sins are no more, that your name is still written in the Lamb's book of life, that the suffering death of Jesus produced resurrection for us and that God really does love you. Remember that. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, please prepare us to wait on you faithfully and to listen to you. Even if you come to us in a whisper, we are blessed. Please do for us as you have promised throughout your word. Listen to our prayers. Answer us according to your good and pleasing will and show us how often you bless us so that even in times of great trial, we will be about to count the blessings that we still receive rather than the ones we see that have been taken away. In the blessed name of Jesus, amen. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. Psalm 3, verse 4 and 5. God bless you.